I want to thank a commenter named Anonymous Person um, for directing me toward pages 184 and 185 of Phaser's Five Proofs book, um, where Phaser gives a reply to my objection that his argument for motion only gets us at best to the conclusion um, that there's an actualizer without any potential for existence, specifically not uh, an actualizer without any potential whatsoever. Um, and in replying to this objection, he appeals to two basic tenets of Thomism. The first is the principle agra sequitur essa, uh, and this is Latin for action follows being. And Phaser introduces this principle on page 174 of his book, and there he says that this principle basically boils down to this. Um, a thing can only do what its essence does not preclude it from doing. So, for example, uh, a stone can't take in nutrients, even though a plant's nature allows it to do that. Uh, and a stone's nature precludes it from using language, even though a rational animal's nature or essence allows it to do that. Now, right off the bat, you might be just as skeptical as I was when I first heard this principle, um, that it has any real relevance to my objection, because once you know that there is a first member of a hierarchical causal series, that lacks any potential to exist, you don't thereby know anything about its essence that tells you that the essence precludes its having some other potential. Um, for one thing, you don't even know that it essentially has the property of lacking any potential to exist. But even if it does have that essentially, then it's a further question whether it essentially lacks any other kind of potential. But you can start to see the relevance of Phaser's principle, agora sequitur essa, to my objection um, if you first distinguish between the potential for action and the potential for existence. So a potential for action is something like the potential to become cold, the potential to be held up, the potential to be pushed, whatever. Um, and this is not just the potential for being or existing. It's a different kind of thing. Um, and so if we literally translate agora sequitur essa, what it's saying is action follows being. And Phaser interprets this as um, the way that a thing's action is reflects the way that a thing's being is. And so the thought is we can infer from this that the way that a thing's action relates to potentiality is similar or the same as the way that a thing's being relates to potentiality. In other words, if a thing has potentials for action, then it should likewise have potentials for being or existence. Um, but you might be wondering, what really is the support of this literal interpretation of the principle? Because what Phaser seemed to defend earlier in the book was just that a thing cannot do what its essence precludes. And that seems eminently plausible to me, but the principle that the way that a thing's action is reflects the way that a thing, thing's being is, is kind of different from that. Here's the response I anticipate from Phaser. I oversimplified the formulation of the principle that he presented and briefly defended uh, earlier in the book on pages 174 and 175. Um, so he didn't just say that a thing can't do what its essence precludes or what is absolutely contradictory with what its essence entails. Um, he said that a thing can't do what goes beyond its nature. Um, and the only exception he makes to this is that a thing can go beyond its nature when it is acted upon by some outside force. Um, and what he means by go beyond its nature is do something that doesn't flow from its nature. So for example, um, it doesn't flow from a puppet's nature that it moves. In fact, when the puppet is left to its own devices, its nature ensures that it doesn't move. But when the puppeteer, a puppeteer inter intervenes, picks it up, then it moves. And there's nothing impossible or inexplicable about this. Phaser thinks that if, as I proposed, all hierarchical series terminate with actualizers that have potential for action but not for existence, then these actualizers' potentials for action are analogous 
to the puppet's moving on its own. That is, the actualizer's potentials for action go beyond their natures. Just like the puppet's moving on its own is not explained by anything in its nature, there's nothing in the nature of these actualizers that explains their having a potential for action. After all, the most metaphysically fundamental aspect of these actualizers, namely their existence, doesn't involve potentiality at all, so why shouldn't we expect the same of their action? The first key question to consider in evaluating Phaser's objection is, does the potential for action really go beyond the nature of any of these actualizers? If so, then Phaser may have a point, but if not, then his objection doesn't really get off the ground. And I think the only answer we're rationally entitled to give to this question is, who knows? Because we really aren't in a position to know much about this thing's, any of these actualizers' natures. Apart from general skeptical worries about our ability to distinguish between a thing's essence and its accidents, in the case of these actualizers, hypothetical actualizers, we have very little information of the kind that we would normally use to determine what a thing's essence is. For example, as for all we know, we haven't even observed or detected any of these actualizers. And at this point in the argument, it's dialectically unfair for Phaser to assume that the things are purely actual, because I'm questioning the argument leading up to that conclusion. And so we're not licensed to make the inferences that Phaser does from pure actuality to the divine attributes at this point, even if those inferences are good. And so at this point in the argument, assuming that a regress is impossible, all we've concluded about these actualizers is that they terminate hierarchical series and they lack any potential for existence. Now, Faisler wants to say the following to dispel our skeptical worries. Um, if you can take any one of these actualizers and conclude that at one metaphysical level it lacks an attribute, doesn't exhibit an attribute, then you can infer from this reasonably that at any higher metaphysical level or less fundamental metaphysical level of the thing, it won't exhibit that attribute there either. I think the type of inference that Phaser is employing here is unreliable, so allow me to provide a counterexample. If I observe that a human's cells don't speak a language, and I further observe that those cells are at a more metaphysically fundamental level than the human's vocal system and nervous system, since those cells make up both of those systems, um, should I infer that a human speaking a language on its own as a function of its nervous system and vocal system goes beyond its nature? No, and in fact, it's part of human nature to be able to speak a language. This just goes to show that sometimes attributes or activities that are exhibited by less fundamental parts of a thing, but not exhibited by more fundamental parts of a thing, are still part of that thing's nature. I suspect that Phaser is already implicitly assuming that the first member of a hierarchical series has an essence that's identical to its existence, and so there's no less metaphysically fundamental part of this first member's essence than its existence, because there's no part of it other than its existence. But, of course, at this point, it would be dialectically ineffective for him to make that assumption because he hasn't shown that this being is purely actual and he hasn't shown that it's God. And so he can't infer from its pure actuality or its godhood that it is such that its essence just is its existence. The second key question to ask in evaluating Phaser's objection is, assuming the potential for action does go beyond the actualizer's nature, is there some outside force that can explain the actualizers having that potential? And it's important to note that I'm not asking whether we can explain by some outside force the actualization of the potential. And I'm not asking that because I think the answer to that is fairly easy. Yes, there is some outside force that can explain it. It's, it's probably no more difficult to explain the actualization of its potential for action than it is to explain, say, 
the actualization of coffee's potential to become cold, even though we really don't know much about what types of actions this actualizer would have a potential for. I'm just positing in my hypothetical scenario that it has some potential for action, so it's left unspecified what kinds of actions it has potential for. So our second key question is just concerned with the having of a potential, not the actualization of a potential. I'm going to need some more time to answer this question satisfactorily, but I thought I'd bring it up just as food for thought. That's all I'll say for now on the Thomistic principle of action follows being. The second basic tenet of Thomism that Phaser brings to bear on my objection is divine simplicity. He writes on page 185 of Five Proofs, To say of God that he has potentiality with respect to his activity, though not with respect to his existence, entails that God has parts, a purely actual part, and a part that is a potentiality. Um, now, of course, it wouldn't be fair for Phaser to say at this point that God, by his very nature, is divinely simple, is perfectly simple, and so it doesn't have parts. But um, if the first member of a hierarchical series had no potential for existence, but had a potential for action, then it would have parts. And so the first member of a hierarchical series must have no potential for action. That wouldn't be fair because it would be presupposing that the first member is God. And he hasn't been able to establish that at this point. Um, what's in contention at the moment is whether this actualizer even is purely actual. And then it, it takes even more inference to conclude that something that's purely actual is God. So we certainly haven't gotten to that point yet. Luckily, Phaser goes on to formulate his reply to my objection in a fairer way. So he says, now, as we saw in chapter 2, whatever has parts requires a cause. And so he's referring back to the chapter on his second proof, which we haven't even gone through yet, but I hope to get to in this series. Um, he says, the reason that whatever has parts requires a cause is that the whole of which the parts are constituents is merely potential until actualized by some principle which combines the parts. And so what follows from this is that um, if the first member of a hierarchical series has parts, and he's saying it would if it has no potential for existence, but it does have some potential for action, um, then it requires a cause, which means that it's actually not the first member at all, because there's something else that's actualizing its existence. Um, now, this is a pretty reasonable argument on the face of it, but I think there's something in here that we can question. There are actually two aspects of this that one can question. The first is, does an actualizer that has potential for action but not for existence really need to have parts? Um, well, he says that it would have to have a purely actual part and a part that is a potentiality. So what would this purely actual part be? Presumably, it would be its existence, but I don't think that things that exist have existence as a part. Um, my body exists, but it doesn't have existence as a part. What it has as parts are things like atoms, cells, organs, not existence. Existence is not found inside of an existent thing, so it's not even a region of that thing, let alone a region that is separated enough from other regions of the thing to be considered an individual part. Um, and I think something similar can be said about potentiality. Do, does the potentiality really reside within the thing that has the potential? I'm not entirely sure of that. But if it does, then okay, maybe potentiality is the only part that a thing has. In which case, we're not saying that it has multiple parts, we're just saying it is potential. But if we don't want to say that it is identical to a potential, instead we can say that it has a region um, that is a potentiality. That is, there is potentiality within it, but that region is not separated from other regions of the actualizer in such a way that the potentiality can be considered an individual part. 
Now, what is this talk of regions as opposed to parts? Well, you can at least mentally divide a thing that occupies space into regions in this sense. So imagine that the thing is placed inside of a three-dimensional coordinate system. Um, then you can think of the different portions of that coordinate system that are occupied by areas of the object. Um, and those areas of the object that occupy those portions are different regions of the object. If you think of the entire portion of this 3D coordinate system that the object occupies, it seems like there are so many, infinitely many ways of dividing up this portion into smaller regions that there are bound to be regions of this thing that have boundaries that don't line up with the boundaries of the parts of the thing. Now it seems conceivable, to me at least, for there to be a thing such as one of the most basic building blocks of a material objects, if some building blocks are more basic than all others, um, that isn't made up of anything, doesn't have parts, but it does have regions because it occupies space and so is extended across a portion of a three-dimensional coordinate system. But if we deny that the first member of a hierarchical series, because it has a potential for action, must have this thing called potentiality inside of it, then we can say that this first member just has an improper part, namely the member itself, and that improper part exemplifies both the property of lacking a potential for existence and the property of having a potential for action. And you might be thinking, well, if it exemplifies two different properties, then it must have two different parts. That's just how properties work. But I don't think that's really true. Um, but if it is, then okay, maybe, maybe we can say those two properties are actually the same property in the same way that Thomas will say that all of the divine attributes are the same property. The second thing we can question about Phaser's argument is the part where he says the reason that whatever has parts requires a cause um, is that the whole of which the parts are constituents is merely potential until actualized by some principle which combines the parts. Now it seems true from everyday experience that most things that are made up of parts begin to exist after some process of combining these parts that were originally separate. Uh, but after that process of combining has happened, and we're just considering um, the static unity that is this whole, um, if we consider it at any given instant, it's not obvious whether it's the whole or the parts that are more dependent on the other. And so, we could instead say that in a hierarchical series of things that are composing each other, um, that the parts are merely potential until actualized by some principle which separates them, despite there being parts of the same whole, this unified thing that is the whole. I take it that this is roughly the idea that metaphysician Jonathan Schaffer defends when he defends priority monism, and according to that view, wholes can be ontologically prior to their parts rather than the other way around. Um, and he gives the example of the cosmos as one whole that, whose parts depend on it, but that does not depend on its parts. Um, and I don't know if he thinks that that's the only example of such a whole, but it seems at least plausible to me that we can extend this to other holes. Hopefully I'll have more to say when we actually go through the full second proof, um, but I'm gonna stop there. So until next time.